Pepe Owens is in his ninth season as head coach of the Akron Zips. It's the longest tenure of any football coach in the Mid-American Conference. Over the last four years, Coach Owens has guided his team to winning seasons two of the four last years. Also, importantly, they're 16-7 and seven against Mid-American Conference Eastern opponents. Lee, thank you for joining us here on One Man Show tonight. I wanted to get right into some things here, and I think that the first question is the um, pro players that have been turned out here at the University of Akron. Um, you've got Dwight Smith, Jason Taylor. When these guys first came on campus uh, at Akron, did you have a feeling that they were destined for something uh, a lot bigger than just college football, maybe at the pro level? And tell us a little bit about the transition you saw during their playing days from when they first came to camp as freshmen and to now where they are as professionals. Yeah, there's no question that all three had great potential as high school players. And, and they all developed a different, uh, you know, different uh, pace. Uh, when you look at the way Dwight, Dwight was a little more developed coming out of high school and, and has done an outstanding job with Tampa Bay. Where Jason Taylor, he started his, you know, he was 197 pound free safety and <laughs> went from safety to <laughs> linebacker. That I didn't know. Yeah, linebacker yeah. to end and, and, and really left here at about a 240 pound end. So, and I think he's playing with the Dolphins now at about 270. So physically they dealt, developed at a different pace and, 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 and as well as mental. The, the one common thread with all the players and we have five or six playing in the NFLs they have great passion for the great game they love to play the game of football I, I think that's the one thing they all have in common you know we, we talk about the game of football but it transcends so many different barriers I know at um, Akron the players get out into the community they work with charitable causes uh, they serve as role models not only in the Akron area but in other parts of Ohio. Tell our viewers some of the things that the players do in the off season to contribute to the community. M not so much even in Akron, but maybe around all of Ohio. Yeah, we make our weekly trips to the uh, Akron Children's Hospital, but but outside of that, I, I give you an example. Just before camp started, we took four of our football players: uh, Matt Cherry, Mo Ellington, Bob Henry, and Charlie Fry. Of course, I think he's been involved in every community activity to Ashland uh, University, and the GMAC Bowl sponsors four or five camps around the country for fatherless boys and this uh, is called Camp Focus but all of our guys just took a little bit of time to speak as role models about the importance of uh, what a team means and uh, importance of academics and staying eligible and, and what it's like to play in college and it, it took questions for about 30 minutes they didn't want to leave it was just a great experience it's a great camp sponsored by uh, the GMAC folks and, and I was really proud that our players could participate. Tell us a little about the three players from our Cox viewing area here tonight. Jason Giacchetti, uh, Mike Griskowiak, and Justin Hine. Now, Jason played football, for many of our viewers who may or may not know, at St. Edwards High School. He's from Brooklyn. Uh, Mike uh, grew up in North Olmsted but attended Holy Name High School. He played football right there in Parma Heights. And then Justin Hine uh, lived in Lakewood, went to Lakewood High School. Three players from our viewing area. Tell us what you've seen in these players since they've joined the program here at Akron, how they came to, about to, to play football for the Zips as well. Well, let's start with Chris Kowiak. Mike, uh, his brother Jeff played for us for four years. He was a starter for four years, and he's currently with the Chicago Bears. He's still on active roster there, and he's doing a great wow. job for him. He's in NFL Europe last year, and, and so uh, when it was time for Mike to be recruited, it was pretty simple. He's going to go play where his brother was playing, and, <laughs> yeah. and Mike's uh, plays center for us. He also plays a little bit of tackle, so uh, it's, it's been both – both Chris Coax and wonderful parents, very, very supportive people. Jason Cicchetti just joined our team from St. Ed's. Now, you know, he's, he's, he's here as a long snapper. He's probably a little better hockey player than he was a football player, but he's a great long snapper, as I said. You know, it seems like a lot of the guys that play football at St. Ed also played hockey. Yeah, so he, yeah. he's a good player there. The other thing about Jason is he was class president at uh, St. Ed's High School. Now, that just doesn't happen by accident, so you can tell the character he has. Justin Hyde from Lakewood is huge six foot five 335 pounds and and uh, still a number two role but he'll he'll get a lot of snaps this year he's got potential to be uh, another guy who could play in the nfl someday you know let's focus a little bit about justin hine here for a minute lee uh, at six five 300 pounds and basically the size of a cellular telephone tower <laughs> he couldn't have came to the college ranks that size could he what size was he when he first stepped foot on the football field and 
how were you able to bulk him up to the size that he's at now? Well, I think Justin was was nearly a 300 pounds. Now he wasn't wow. as strong as he is now. He's 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 really body's changed and he's got great strength and and improved his his footwork's improved. But uh, you know Kevin Feld does a great job at Lakewood and he, he has a nice program. His players are always well prepared to go go play well in college. Lee, um, in all the years you've been coach at Akron. Uh, the Zips have been known for the walk-on program. That is a player that didn't get a scholarship, but came to Akron, walked on, tried out. Tell us how all of that works. Tell the viewers exactly what a high school player does if he doesn't get a scholarship, the high school years winding down, his senior years winding down high school, and he wants to play college football. What are the steps to be a walk-on player? It's really tough, number one, to just make the roster because we're limited in the number of walk-ons we can take. And so we'll recruit so many guys that, you know, it's, it's an inexact science recruiting. And so there's a lot of guys on the bubble, and there's not enough Division One scholarships to go around. If we meet a guy and we think he has a chance, meet a, meet a player, and, you know, there's, there's just something about him or that's the heart or he has a desire to play at this level, we'll a lot of times give him a chance. And many times it works out to be some of our best football players. Okay, stop that. Three, two, one. In Parma and Olmstead Falls, Lee, Rocky, River, Lakewood, all the communities in the Cox viewing area, football's a big sport. Uh, and nothing illustrates this more than the fact of how many peewee leagues exist for children that are, and girls as well as the boys, that are five years old, six years old, seven years old. Um, and it helps the children develop their skills for football at maybe the junior high and high school level. As a parent out there of a, a girl or a boy that's maybe six, seven, eight years old, what are some of the things you can work on with your kids in the backyard that will help them understand the game of football a little better, but also help their game develop a little better too? You know, what sure. can you tell parents out there that is good advice versus maybe all the bad advice that, that you could possibly get out there now? I think that the two best suggestions I can make are, first of all, the part of the football game that you need to work on at that level would be the skill part of it. A lot of times, youngsters aren't developed enough physically to, to block and to tackle and to get caught up in the physical aspects of football. But they can throw, they can catch, they can punt, they can kick, they can long snap. Uh, and here's Jason Cicchetti from uh, you know St. Ed's High School as a full scholarship just because he was a long snapper. Uh, so if you could develop some skills, and not worry about physically knocking people around, that's, that's important, that's number one. And number two is just to keep it fun. I think so often we push so hard at such an early age that I've seen a lot of youngsters just flat burn out on the game. Mm -hmm. And it's a tough physical game, and, and if, 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 if for some reason you have a negative experience when you're little, you may never play when you're older, you might be more capable of playing and have some, a lot more success. I want to share something with you, too, that maybe you haven't heard, but I've talked with some parents, mothers, I think, more so than the dads, um, about the roughness of the game of football, um, that they'd rather have their sons play soccer, uh, march in the marching band, but football's too vicious of a sport. They fear that injury to their child. As a football coach, and you've been around the game decades, sure, sure. even though you still only look like you're 23 <laughs> years old, um, you've been around the game a long time. What can you say to those parents out there that maybe are taking that stance? They feel that the game's too rough and tough for their eight-year-old to play, and they'd rather have them play a, a sport that's maybe more docile. There, there's a lot of merit to that because a, a game like soccer is, uh, for the most part, non-contact. And you can work the skills, kicking a ball, the hand-eye coordination, uh, being able to run, the physical conditioning part of it. And, and avoid the contact. T to try to play football without contact and are to your, and, and ready for contact, it's, it's difficult. And I've never been a big fan of the full contact um, leagues where youngsters are trying to play before they're capable of playing. So they, they really make a good argument. Okay, stop that there. Three, two, one. Coach, you've seen probably a lot of high school programs throughout Ohio. Uh, you were down in the Maslin area to start your career. Um, and through the years, the game's changed a lot. It really has, uh, both with technology and video and, the, and, if nothing else, the ability to scout teams and, and in the weight room and the training room to develop players. High school football in Northeast Ohio, I want you to walk us through a couple of snapshots, maybe over the last 30 years, how it's changed for the better or maybe for the worse. 
Yeah. And, and you're right. I mean, I was a high school football coach for 15 years, and and it does go back three decades. And and, and really saw the game change a lot. And you, you've, you've hit on the highlights. I, you know, you take a, a program like St. Ignatius, where Coach Kyle has had mm -hmm. such great success over the years, and he's been able to kind of keep up with the, the changes. The big change being the, the strength and conditioning programs that high schools are putting together. There was a, a very few high schools had weight rooms when, when I started coaching and very few had strength programs or off season programs. Now, I don't know if there's a high school out there that doesn't have a weight room. A lot of them have strength coaches. A lot of them train year round. Mm -hmm. That's probably the biggest difference. The technology as far as being able to, to video and study video really helps improve the game. I can think back again where we were lucky to have eight millimeter tape. A few, few, few schools had six, I remember yeah, that. 16 millimeter yeah. if you had a bigger it budget. Me too. Yeah, but, but you know what? It was hard to get, it was hard to process. You couldn't do practice because you couldn't afford to develop it. Well, now you, you, you have videotape and you, you, you video the practice, you study the practice, you get better. And so that, that's the technology. They all have computers now. Everybody's computer scouted now. All the high schools punch in all the tendencies. So the game's improved in those two areas. You're exactly right. Okay, stop that. Let's uh, continue on that, that topic for a minute. I remember when I was in high school, you're, you're absolutely right. We had a machine called the Leaper, and there was one bench you laid on your back and you bench pressed weights. But I will say this, though. When I played high school football in the late 70s and early 80s, we were allowed to play more than one sport at the same time. If you wanted to march in marching band and still play football, or if you wanted to play a sport that maybe could be played but not interfere with football, you were allowed to. I've seen that attitude change to the point where it's rare to find anybody at a school in any form, any coach, especially on the girls' side I've noticed, where they'll let a player participate in two sports at the same time. Is it just because the game's changed to where the demands are greater on the student athlete where that can't be done? Or is it just a philosophy of the coaches and their desire to win even more so than in the past that maybe stops a kid from being able to play two sports if he could and just limiting him to that one sport? I think both. I, I think you, there is a lot of pressure to win. And, all, and the coach is trying to win, trying to move up the ladder. And for him to win, he needs to have his athletes train year-round. And, and, and if you're the baseball coach, you don't want your player to leave early from summer baseball and go out for summer football and get hurt. Or if you're the basketball coach, you don't want to lose a player during the season to a football injury and only getting back late, you know, half the, halfway through the season. So the demands to win, the demands, the, the full year-round training, but I'm, I'm, I'm just so much against that. I really think athletes in high school need to have as many experiences as possible, keep as many doors open for as long as possible, because you're not sure what's going to be the best sport. I think as long as you're participating, as long as you're competing, we, as far as from a recruiting perspective, it means a lot to us to go recruit an athlete. He's a football player and say, now does, does he run track? Does he wrestle? Is he a basketball player? Does he play baseball? And, it, and you know, all of a sudden, his stock goes up if he participates in more than just football. Mm -hmm. We, I wanted to share this with our listeners, too, to, to follow up with us. I remember a few years back when I was doing high school football at Rocky River High School. We have our viewers out there that have kids that go to Rocky River. Um, there was a gentleman on the football team that actually played in the band. And this was actually the last time I saw this. This was in the mid-90s. Is he a tuba player? <clears throat> actually, he was. Yeah, okay. He was a tuba player. <laughs> yeah. And he came out in his football uniform and pads, and he put the sousaphone on around him, and he went out there and marched with the, the band. And that was such an exciting feeling just as a spectator as an adult to see someone that committed to music as well as the game of football. Well, I think recruiting is critical. You know it's a lifeblood of college, but as a high school coach all those years, I recruit them out of the band. I recruit them off the, what, out of the hallway, you know, the debate team, every sports team. I wanted all the athletes I could possibly have on the football team, and some of them turned out to be pretty good. You know, we talk about the football team, too. Let's talk about the camps. And I know a lot of parents that are gung-ho about football out there in the Cox Viewing area, they're always looking for opportunities to put their, their football athletes into a program that's um, out there during the off-season that will help them develop their skills. At Akron, you have quite a few camps. Tell our listeners about some of those camps and what skills they specifically address. Well, we have camps that are designed for linemen or designed for quarterbacks and receivers. Or we have camps that are designed for senior athletes or look to be recruited where we'll have lots of colleges represented so the player gets exposed. Exposure. Now, is that the Rising Star camp? The Rising Star, yeah. yeah. It's just for the best seniors in the area. We usually end up with about 100 football players. Wow. 
We also have team camps where we'll have 20 teams on three different days come in and compete for seven on seven. That's actually how we found Charlie Fryer, quarterback, was at a seven on seven camp. So we try to get guys on campus as much as we can to evaluate the athletes and give them some skill development. But once again, to try to to try to spend as much money as some of the camps are and send a youngster away for a week and really believe it's going to improve him skills wise, I don't see the the benefit to that. I I think. The, the greatest benefit to a camp is either a local camp, it's one day, it's very inexpensive, or going to a camp like Michigan or Ohio State as a senior athlete to get exposure to a lot of schools in the Mid-American Conference if you have some Division One aspirations. So then there probably is something to the point that the name of the camp I think a lot of parents think are going to give their kid more just because of the name that's on the moniker versus you know staying close and maybe working on just the fundamentals the camp has to offer. I remember growing up that was the case. Yes. People would say well I went to this camp and yet the minute you strapped it on and you went full contact the kid didn't hit any harder than you did when you took the pads off last season but you know he was telling everybody well because I went to the Wisconsin camp or the Michigan camp or the Ohio State camp you know I'm that much better. Well that didn't seem to be the case and you'd have the guy that maybe went to the, you know, the, the Akron camp or the BW camp or the, the, even the John Carroll camp, let's say, and they seem to have maybe come away with more than just going to the camp because of the bigger price tag and, and the bigger name. And it is more money. The, the greatest advantage to a camp like Ohio State or Michigan is that all we'll have two coaches at Ohio State and two coaches at Michigan, as well as the rest of the schools in the MAC. Mm -hmm. So it's great exposure to a lot of Division One schools. You don't learn anymore. You don't become a better football player. But it is great exposure if you really think you have a chance to be a Division One football player. When we talk about Division One football players, and I know a moment ago um, we covered the topic of walk-ons, but let's talk about scholarships now. Um, it's easy, I guess, if you're really a talented player and you're getting the letters and you're getting the phone calls, but what if you're a player you feel has the skills but you're not getting the attention? How would a player or his family go about contacting someone like yourself or the recruiting office at at let's say even the University of Akron, what would be the correct way to do that to seek someone else out to maybe send film to or talk to about your student athlete? Not even if it's football, let's just say maybe it's volleyball or basketball too. I, I believe it's through the high school coach. It, it, first and foremost, uh, if, if a parent is calling to promote their son, we have to kind of sort out between how much is heart and how much is head in terms of his <laughs> yeah. evaluation. True. But if it's the high school coach and he's a straight shooter, we have a better feel for that recommendation. So all Always through the high school coach. Very seldom have we been. We have very seldom will we recruit an athlete who is a self promoter. Uh, we go to every high school. We look at every high school game, so we don't miss a lot of guys. But if the high school coach steps up and said, like Joe Yost at Ellet High School in Akron mm. this year, said, "Hey, Brian Howe's a great football mm -hmm. player. You've missed him," and we went back and looked again, and he was right, and he's proved that in camp this year. Now the Rubber Bowl in Akron, which is about 45 minutes south of all of you out there in the, the Cox viewing area, got a facelift, so to speak, on, on the playing surface itself. The turf has been replaced uh, with a new surface. Will that mean any difference in the level of play or the game or the style or maybe how you coach having this new surface? I've been there. We're going to take a look at it later in the show. Um, it is a far cry um, as far as difference goes between what the old surface was and the new surface from speed, maybe how you hit the ground and, and all of the the intricacies involved with that. Yeah, we've been on a few times. Uh, before we made a decision, we went to John Carroll and had a chance to go uh, and took some players along and we walked through the turf and had a field. It's the exact same system that we went with, same yeah. same turf. Uh, in camp, we've, we've scrimmaged at Mount Union. They have the same system, same turf. So we have a feel for what it's like. Uh, I don't know how much of our game it'll change, our attack will change. I know that um, we'll feel better about ourselves. We'll, f we're, we're, we'll be proud of the stadium and you know we we'll want to break it in with a great year. So. Uh, uh, that part of it's uh, exciting. Anytime, anytime there's something new, whether it's our new indoor facility or turf at the stadium, it makes our players feel important, like they matter, because they put a lot of time and effort in, and now they want to kind of live up to that investment the schools made made in the team. Have you ever recruited a student athlete in one sport and then found out maybe that his skills or her skills, maybe you've heard of it on, on the women's sure. uh, athletic program side of things too, where 
they probably were better suited for a different team in a different sport sure. to refer them to that coach. Yeah, we've had uh, athletes that we've recruited end up going to track. There's been some track athletes come to football. You know, when Jason Taylor was here, he was a football and basketball player. That and, I didn't uh, know. Yeah, so I mean, yeah. there's been a few guys that could do that and could play, you know, more than one sport. So, and, you know, and what happens is they have to sort out. Uh, I had Bobby Henry from North Canton with me today, and we, or the other day, and we went back to his high school, and one of the, the father said, Bobby, when did you decide it was football? And he used to wrestle and run track. And he said, you know, I just I just knew that was the game I loved. That's what I wanted to do. And if I kept wrestling, I couldn't get as big as I wanted to to play football. And so he made that decision. And, and I think a lot of athletes have to do that sometimes. I want to talk to you here just real quick about one of the biggest wins in the University of Akron football history last season. I had the pleasure of being at that game, the Marshall game. What did that mean to your program in the offseason, beating a nationally ranked team at home, a game that probably most of the fans didn't think that the Zips had a chance to win. You beat Byron Leftwich, um, and it goes down as one of the biggest wins in football history at the university. What did that mean to your program uh, during the offseason and coming into this football campaign? Well, after that win, we just took off. We played really good football from that point forward. It was uh, uh, We started playing great defense. Uh, we knew that at that point we could beat any team. and mm -hmm. We had some tough losses early in the season against some great opponents. and, and, and the, the, the thing about our season last year is we didn't fold. When we are 0-6, we didn't fold. I mean, our guys kept playing, kept getting better, and, and found a way to, to win those games at the end, including the Marshall win. So, um, And I'll never forget the pregame meal. Our guys were still a little loose and, and not as concentrated as they need to be. And Charlie Fry stood up from the captain's table and says, he said to the team, he said, you guys don't realize this is serious. I mean, this is serious. We need to approach this in the right way. We can win this football game. And, I mean, I think that has much to do with the way we played as anything that happened. Uh, that whole week. I'm going to take you down memory lane as we wrap things up here. Um, your fondest memory since you've been head coach at the University of Akron. I think the year we beat Navy at Navy, and it, yeah, that was yeah, a big one. Yeah. I forgot about that. One. <laughs> we come yeah. back and scored three or four touchdowns in the fourth quarter, and it was yeah. their homecoming, and Roger Staubach was there, and we were a big underdog. Oh, and, oh, that's and, the whole enchilada oh, there. Was, boy. It was everything, and it was yeah. uh, it was our sixth win. It guaranteed us our first winning season. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I think that was probably as as good a moment as we've had. And now a couple of the Kent wins have been good too, but but that was well, you've probably, beaten Kent. <laughs> that was special. <laughs> the, the, they've they've lost quite a few times to you here. You've got a streak going. How many times in a row have you beat Kent? Well, we, we've won six in a row, but wow. that, none of that matters now. We play them again on the 28th of August. Fresh and season fresh every season. time. That's exactly yeah. right. As far as recruiting goes, um, I guess um, there's a lot of things we can and can't talk about. How much time, though, do you spend, and does it ever stop? Uh, time do you spend on recruiting? I mean, even during the season now, I'm sure you're probably watching films or fielding inquiries or, or working with the recruiting department. It's a year-round second job for you, isn't it? Recruiting is, is full-time all year. We, we just we brought a couple players in late in June and July for visits that end up we, we found at one school or another that hadn't found a scholarship or maybe they made their grades late and, and they've ended up being good players for us. So And we've started for next year while well, we started clear back in the spring. You know, It's it's year-round and it's your lifeblood and you have to work hard at it and you have to enjoy it mm. at, and, 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 yeah. and our staff does a really nice job at it. They've gained a lot of credibility around the state and the different regions they recruit and, and that really helps. Do you ever have time to get out and shoot any golf? <laughs> we do. Did you carry the sticks in the trunk of the car when you're going on a road game? The trunk is what he said. Find a coach with uh, golf clubs in his trunk, and I'll show you a coach that can't win football games. But, you know, I I, uh, I like to play. Mostly it's like in outings and stuff and you yeah. know, that sort of thing. But uh, if, if I play, you know, a dozen times a year, it's been a big year. And as football coaches go, you know, you you can't, September you you really can play from maybe May to August, but after that, I mean, it's football. <laughs> There's a lot of construction going on right now on the campus of the University of Akron. A lot of new sports facilities being built. This is important to the student athletes in the viewing area, maybe that feel as though they want to play college sports again, girls or boys, um, either athletic programs uh, on campus. What? do the new facilities mean to the athletic programs and again I encourage everyone out there that's that's in high school or even junior high and even new parents out there take your children to the universities here 
in Northeast Ohio. Take them on a road trip, even if it's once every couple of months. Plant the seed of a college education. Maybe they won't play college sports, but plant the seed. Akron's just a 40, 45 minute drive away. You have John Carroll, you have Case, you have Bowling Wallace, Cleveland State. All of these universities are close. And you know, the saddest thing is, I'll even talk to the neighbors on my street. You know, they'll have a 12 year old or a 14 year old. Have you taken them to a campus here in Northeast Ohio? Well, what for? And it's kind of sad. So I encourage a lot of folks to come down to the University of Akron, see a lot of the new things going on. But back to the question, I'll let you answer it now. Um, what kind of boost will this add to the athletic programs for the Zips? Well, first of all, you mentioned all those colleges and you forgot Kent, and that does my heart well. No. well <laughs> but it is a great school. It we have a lot of kids. It wasn't on purpose. It really was, I'm sure. But uh, there are a lot of great schools here. Uh, mm. uh, tremendous institutions, including Kent State, believe me. Sure. And I, I have great respect for that school. But what we're doing right now is trying to keep up. I mean, their facilities, if you look at their indoor facility and their, their, their student rec center at, at Kent State, one mm -hmm. of the schools we compete against for students, our Bowling Green, we had to catch up. And we're doing that. We're building an indoor facility. We're building a student rec center. We just built a new student union, a new arts and science building, a new polymer annex. And we're, you know, closing down roads and, and, and building walkways and planting trees. And our whole campus, the landscape's completely changing. Lord our knows the construction on Route 8's been uh, bad for uh, about a year. Uh, yeah, at the same time, <laughs> yeah. that's happening. The highway's being redone. And uh, thank goodness for Dr. Proenza and his vision and courage to make this move forward. And, and our athletic director, Mike Thomas, who's really kind of orchestrated all the athletic components of it. So we're very fortunate right now. Lee, thank you for being on thank One Man Show tonight. All right, I enjoy working with you. Well, it's dark and rainy here at Fairview Park High School. Homecoming between the Fairview Warriors and the Rocky River Pirates. Terrible lighting on my face. What are you going to do, though? It's raining, it's dark, it's dreary. I guess it's football weather. Sit back and enjoy as One Man Show concludes this episode with footage of the Fairview Park Rocky River homecoming football game. a little close to your show host Z Zoltai here on One Man Show.
Well done. Ready. 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 Ready.